On this Wednesday night, mounting casualties from the heat wave in the West. This is a natural disaster. The spike in heat-related deaths, the questions about why the vulnerable weren't protected, plus the rise in wildfires, and the Canadian climate scientist who says this extreme weather is the new reality. 182 more unmarked graves, another devastating discovery at a former residential school. The whole system of residential schools was a genocide. Plus, Canadian radio stations amplifying Indigenous voices. And he's a free man again. Why Bill Cosby's sex assault conviction was thrown out. Global National with Donna Friesen. Oh, that's hot. That's hot. This narrow escape from a wildfire happened in B.C.'s interior near Lillooet, the region caught in record-setting high temperatures. The driver did manage to get to safety, but the tinder-dry forests are ripe for more dangerous fires. After days of record-breaking heat, almost all of B.C. is now under high or extreme fire danger. Those kinds of conditions in June are extremely unusual. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There is still no relief tonight for much of Western Canada. Heat warnings remain in place for most of B.C., all of Alberta, all of Saskatchewan and most of Manitoba. It's forecast to hit 41 in Lytton, B.C. today. Not another record-breaking day, but still scorching. In Alberta, Fort McMurray was expected to hit 41 as well, while Saskatoon is forecast to reach 34. In southern B.C., a place not accustomed to such prolonged heat, the toll is growing by the day. According to B.C.'s chief coroner, at least 486 sudden deaths were reported in the last five days. That's a 195 percent increase in reports. Usually there are about 165 sudden deaths reported in that time frame. Investigations are now underway, but in many cases it's believed heat was a factor. It seems that many folks uh, didn't realize that the heat could be deadly. And so getting this information out, letting people in the province know that we've seen an unprecedented number of deaths is a, a, a real warning to people that, that this can be deadly, heat can be deadly. There are those who believe it adds up to a public health emergency and there are questions about the Premier's response and why more wasn't done to protect the vulnerable. Robin Gill has our top story tonight. At Burnaby General Hospital, it's almost too much. The staff is taking in so many patients, simply unable to deal with the heat. We've had a lot of people coming in with heat stroke. We're over, overwhelmed with people in the emergency room. We've got people lined up down the halls. The heat wave has turned deadly for dozens in the Vancouver area, many of them older people living alone. Seniors living in these apartments, they, are green, they do act a bit as greenhouses. They don't have good uh, cross ventilation. The coroner admits the province was caught off guard. I think it's very likely that many of us um, mis misunderstood the, the extreme risk. Um, you know, that, that we're not used to this heat. Um, in retrospect, we'll be looking at what we can do differently to prevent similar deaths in the future. At no point did British Columbia declare a heat emergency. Fatalities are part of life. Uh, the public was acutely aware that we had a heat problem uh, and we were doing our best to break through all of the other noise to encourage people to take steps to protect themselves. After there was outrage, John Horgan backtracked with a tweet, Mourning families deserve our compassion and the wording of my comments didn't reflect that. The Public Safety Minister is now reviewing the province's Emergency Act. So after we're past this, we will need to take a hard look at what we need to change for the future. Ambulances haven't been able to keep up with calls for heat-related incidents. This former BC paramedic says the province had its head in the sand dealing with this emergency. You know, this is a natural disaster, what's happened. Uh, temperatures in Vancouver are unprecedented. And obviously the numbers are coming out now. People have died. More criticism against the province coming from a former health minister. I would argue that this heat wave is a public health emergency and should have been declared uh, as such. And we, we could have done more to uh, put, uh, I think, some precautions in place. BC's advocate for seniors is asking whether there could have been a warning system in place. But even that may not have been enough to keep those who didn't recognize the danger until it was too late. We just are unaware of how quickly the impact of the heat has overtaken them. Temperatures have diminished in coastal BC as the heat dome moves east over the interior and much of Alberta and Saskatchewan. But this is just June. 
There are many more sweltering summer days ahead. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. A little later, I'll speak with one of the world's top communicators about climate change. Canadian scientist Catherine Hayhoe talks about why it's taken some people so long to recognize the danger we are in. This is what's left of the century-old Catholic Church in Morinville, Alberta. Bystanders watched as it went up in flames early this morning. Fire crews tried to save it but couldn't. Police are treating the fire as suspicious and are investigating. It is the latest in a string of churches that have burned to the ground since the discovery of hundreds of unmarked graves at former church-run residential school sites. Now, another revelation. Another BC First Nation has announced the discovery of more unmarked grave sites at a former residential school. The Tunaha First Nation says ground-penetrating radar has revealed as many as 182 potential graves. They were found at a former school in Cranbrook, B.C. that was run by the Catholic Church. Indigenous leaders are now preparing to take their demands for an apology directly to the Pope at the Vatican. Eric Sorensen explains. Another sad discovery, the remains of 182 bodies in unmarked graves near the former St. Eugene's Mission School in the southeastern corner of British Columbia. Ground-penetrating radar made the disturbing finding last year, believed to be members of the Katanika Nation. There are more than 130 residential school sites in Canada, and Indigenous leaders say answers must be found at all of them. The focus is on getting the research done, the investigation done, and the proper commemora commemorations done. Um, the whole system of residential schools was a genocide. Meantime, the burning of churches has now spread to the East Coast. The most recent, a former Catholic church in Indian Brook, Nova Scotia, home to the Sabakanakati First Nation. In the last 10 days, churches have been burned in three provinces, B.C., Alberta, and Nova Scotia. All but one are Catholic churches that have been destroyed since the discovery of unmarked remains at residential schools. The Prime Minister condemned the apparent arson at the churches, but expressed sympathy once more for the pain Indigenous people and all Canadians are feeling at the discovery of the unmarked grave sites. The destruction of places of worship is unacceptable, and it must stop. We must work together to right past wrongs. Everyone has the role to play. The National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations was critical of the church burnings, but also announced that he will visit the Pope in December hoping that the Catholic Church will apologize for its role in running residential schools and that the Pope will come to Canada to do so in person. We are hopeful that at some point in time, the appropriate words will come, the Spirit will move. All of this comes on the eve of Canada Day, historically a time to celebrate the country and its founding. But this year, a growing number of Canadians find it difficult to celebrate how this country was founded. It's not inappropriate, I don't, I don't think at all, to, to stop and look back. Uh, at our past as we imagine on Canada Day a future we would like to be and would like to become. Canadians really want to see these travesties dealt with. They want to see the proper reparations made. And so that's an opportunity for them to use that day to really bring us closer to what Canada says its national values truly are. There will not be big Canada Day celebrations on Parliament Hill. The pandemic had already seen to that. But this year in particular, many Canadians see this July 1st as a time for a different kind of reflection about the country. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. In Florida, the death toll has risen to 18 in the rubble of that collapsed condo. More than 140 people are still missing. And as Jackson Prosco reports, the grueling search is taking a toll on workers. It is slow, excruciating work. Digging through the rubble by hand finding only pieces of shattered lives. You find strollers and baby bottles, um, stuffed toys. Rescuers found more bodies overnight and more faint possibilities that someone might have survived deep in a tunnel or void. There are minor chances, but I would not say that there are no chances. For the dozens of families still waiting for answers, including the relatives of four missing Canadians, it's an agonizing wait though it's still officially a search and rescue operation. It's not going to stop and they're going to they're going to get answers one way or another. 7 days in, even experienced rescue workers are feeling the toll. Our own guys are hurting inside, I'm sure. Robert Wells and Bowser are part of the Miami-Dade Fire Department's peer support team. 
They're here to help fellow first responders cope with the mental trauma they suffer on the job. Especially the guys that are working on the pile. Uh, they're seeing uh, all kinds of things. There's still no clear indication of what caused the collapse. Engineers are focused on witness reports, like what the building's doorman heard. He heard a muffled boom, and then X number of seconds later, a much bigger boom, and then Y seconds after that, a much bigger boom. Answers could take months. Accounting for all the missing could take weeks in what is now one of the deadliest structural failures in modern U.S. history. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Surfside, Florida. The European Union has a new vaccine passport system, which is good news for millions of people itching to travel. The thing is, they must have received vaccines approved for use in Europe. And that excludes many people, including almost 300,000 Canadians. Redmond Shannon explains. The European Union is gradually rolling out its digital COVID certificate. The program will allow EU residents who've had COVID-19 or who provide a negative test to travel more easily. The same will apply to the fully vaccinated. If and when the EU expands those rules to non-residents, it could be good news for Canadian visitors. Brussels has approved the same four vaccines as Ottawa. However, the EU has not authorised the Indian-made Covishield version of AstraZeneca, only the European-made one. In Canada, 272,000 people have received at least one dose of Covishield, compared with 1.6 million Canadians who have had the European-made AstraZeneca. My understanding is that the two AstraZeneca-manufactured vaccines, European Union and Indian, are biologically identical. So what we've got is a bureaucratic situation here that could well indeed stand in the way uh, of people's freedom of travel. The European Medicines Agency says the maker of Covishield, the Serum Institute of India, hasn't applied for authorization in Europe. You do have to go through this very rigorous quality control process where you are assured that the same process was used and that the vaccine that you have at the end of your process is as good as the one um, that's coming from another plant that's already authorized. The disconnect highlights a broader issue. Hundreds of millions in the developing world are getting shots not approved in the West. I think what we need to do is the world needs to get together and then they need to have a list of vaccines that are approved um, across, across the standard. The EU says its individual member countries can also decide to accept travellers vaccinated with WHO approved shots. Ottawa says it's in talks with the G7 and the WHO on the issue. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Communicating about climate change coming up, why the message doesn't seem to get through until we're immersed in extreme weather. The record-breaking heat wave in the West has made international news, and Canada is not the only country suffering in the heat. Take a look at this map from the World Meteorological Organization. Much of the northern hemisphere is in the midst of an exceptional early hot summer. From North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, Eastern Europe, Iran, and the northwestern Indian subcontinent. Maximum daily temperatures exceeded 45 degrees in a number of places, reaching the 50s in the Sahara. To help understand what's happening, we've reached out to Canadian atmospheric scientist Catherine Hayhoe. She has authored over 100 research papers, written many climate reports, and she teaches at Texas Tech University. She's also the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Catherine, thanks so much for joining us today. Can we start with some context? You have said that global temperatures are rising faster than at any time in the history of human civilization. Why should we look at this latest heat wave as more than just a single exceptional weather event? Well, that is true. Global temperatures are rising and temperatures in Canada are rising twice as fast as the rest of the world. We see this playing out in our monthly temperatures. We are already breaking high temperatures at the monthly scale four times more frequently than low temperature records. But we're also seeing it in how climate change is loading the weather dice against us. So we always have a chance of rolling a double six, a heat wave in the summer. 
But decade by decade, as the planet warms, it's sort of like it's sneaking in and taking one of those numbers on our dice and turning it into another six, taking another number and turning it into a seven. And so we're rolling more sixes and even some sevens today as climate change fuels our natural summer weather patterns. I want to ask you about something that you tweeted, uh, I think, last week. You said our entire civilization is built on the assumption that climate varies within bounds that can be predicted based on the past. You said it's as if we've been driving down the road looking in the rearview mirror, but now we've hit a dangerous curve and our, our wheels are teetering off the edge. It's a great analogy. Why has it taken so long to recognize the danger we're in? We have assumed that we can depend on the past to tell us what the drought of record is, what the average summer or winter temperature is, where the, to draw the flood zones. We've built our civilization on that, not just for decades, but for centuries, even millennia. Yet today, climate is changing faster than any time that we humans have ever experienced in the course of civilization as we know it. And that's why we have to take our eyes off the rear view mirror. We have to look ahead into the future and incorporate information on the changes that are already unavoidable and inevitable into our planning, while at the same time doing everything we can to cut our carbon emissions as much as we can, as soon as we can, to avoid the very worst of the impacts. Do you think that it's just the nature of human behavior that unless we endure something ourselves like this heat wave in the West, we're not likely to take it seriously? We all know the things that we're supposed to be doing, but until we get a wake up call, often many of us are not doing them. Why? Because of something called psychological distance. We humans see risks as being far off. And with climate change, we see psychological distance in spades. If you ask people across North America, do you think climate is changing? Do you think it will affect plants and animals? So other species, not humans. Do you think it will affect people who live in low income countries on the other side of the world? Do you think it will affect future generations? People say yes. But then you say, do you think it will affect you? And the numbers drop precipitously. We just don't see the immediacy of the impacts until we experience them ourselves. Well, scientists have been ringing the alarm bell for a long time now. Do you think they're getting the messaging right? We scientists have been sounding the alarm for a long time. And I think what we got wrong was this. We just assumed if you tell people there's a risk, they'll fix it. But until people recognize, number one, what it means to everything I already care about here and now today, and number two, what we can do, what viable solutions look like, people remain paralyzed and unable to act. And so that's what we see changing today. Not the scientific message, it is still the same. It's real, it's us, it's serious, and the time to act is now. But we're starting to see people recognize that the impacts are real, they're here, they matter, and the solutions are also here and actionable today. Catherine Hayhoe, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Out of prison ahead, why Bill Cosby's sex assault conviction has been overturned. The man who is one of the architects of the American War on Terror has died. Donald Rumsfeld, who was Defense Secretary under former President George W. Bush, oversaw the invasion of Afghanistan and the overthrow of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. He claimed Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, but none were ever found. The war in Iraq killed hundreds of thousands, including thousands of U.S. military members. Many historians and military experts blame Rumsfeld for decisions that led to difficulties in Iraq. He was 88 years old. Bill Cosby is a free man tonight after serving two years of his sentence for sexual assault, a dramatic reversal in his case. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled Cosby had been denied a fair trial. It found that a previous district attorney had made a deal that Cosby would not face prosecution. Cosby then went on to testify in a lawsuit brought by Canadian Andrea Constant. That deposition was later used as evidence against him. Cosby was convicted in 2018 of three felony counts of drugging and sexually assaulting Constant. More than 60 other women also came forward, claiming Cosby drugged and assaulted them over the past five decades. Just listen next, making sure we hear Indigenous voices.
Today, hundreds of broadcasters across Canada use the airwaves to amplify Indigenous voices. The initiative was called A Day to Listen. Of course, we need to spend far more than just one day listening. But as Morgan Campbell explains, this was a start to listen to people whose voices for too long have been unheard. Hear the voices of Indigenous people in Canada. This is a time for elevating Indigenous voices, opening doors to fresh perspectives, sharing stories, reflecting communities. From people like Bob Watts, a member of the Six Nations Reserve in Grand River, Ontario. I think is, is making us think and act and consider things in a way that we never have before. Today is a day to listen. This is why more than 500 stations are taking part in A Day to Listen, which in partnership with the Gord Downey and Chani Wenjack Fund aims to build cultural understanding and to create a path toward reconciliation. We forced them to go to the Indian restaurant to school. Chani Wenjack's story may be familiar from the late Gord Downey's music and a National Heritage Minute. At nine years old, when Jack was forced to attend a residential school in Kenora, Ontario. When he was 12, he escaped in an effort to reunite with his family, but died a week later. Today, there is a renewed call to share stories like when Jack's, a commitment many Indigenous Canadians are calling for. I think Canadians have a great opportunity to, uh, to take part in, in correcting the mistakes of, of the past. And why so many are asking for Canada Day to become a day of remembrance and mourning. Those 215 young people's spirits have woken up everybody, not only in Canada, but the world. Morgan Campbell, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is the Peace Tower in Ottawa. The Prime Minister says the flag will remain at half-mast on Canada Day this year to honour the Indigenous children who died at residential schools. Thanks for watching. I'm off for a few days and we'll see you here again in early July. Bye-bye.